And welcome to SEC Sports Roundtable. This is going to be episode 82. We're going to do a University of Florida football preview tonight. Uh, we've uh, right in the middle of things last week. If you're just joining us, uh, great time to go back and catch up on Missouri. We did our Missouri preview uh, as well as Auburn. So we kicked off the week last week with uh, two programs, two football programs in the SEC. We're going to be doing two programs over the seven weeks in July and August leading up to the last week of the regular or the uh, summer season before we get into regular season play. So it's a great way to get prepared and, and understand what's going on from, from a fan's perspective and we'd like to think some at least somewhat educated fans perspectives. Uh, so without any further ado, another educated fans perspective. Joining me tonight's Blair Smiley. Welcome Blair. Thanks man. It's good to be back. Well, we're glad to have you. I know you had some technical difficulties last week, so we we're glad you uh, got some of those mapped out and worked out through tonight. So if you're new to the program, uh, we do talk SEC football. We do talk some SEC basketball. Been known to talk a little baseball, and that's about as far as we go into the sports, but we try to cover all the three major sports in some way, shape, or fashion. But, of course, the majority of our time, the majority of our energy is going to be spent on uh, football. And so the, this is our third year uh, that we've done an SEC preview, and each time we try to, we've done it a little different, um, and tonight we're going to change things up even in midstream. So uh, tonight we're going to have two separate podcasts, so if you are a fan of Florida you, and you don't want to listen to Mississippi State, you don't have to, and vice versa, or if you want to listen to both, what we're going to do is we're going to then post up a second podcast in the next day or so. So you're going to see back-to-back -back podcasts for the next six weeks, and we'll do two, two podcasts a week for the next six weeks and see how that works. We're going to try that out tonight. Uh, we might just punt and kick and, and retry it and go back to the old format next week if this is just a horrible idea. But we're going to try some, th some new things this year and, and see how that works for us. But uh, get right into things after we finish this housekeeping. Uh, great ways to follow us is going to be on Twitter, SCCSRT, on Facebook, SCCSRT. We even have a Pinterest page. I uh, need to get some new posts up there on that, some pictures, but uh, great tailgating food to, to keep an eye out there. Some great ideas there, a few drinks that might be up there, uh, as well as a, a couple of uh, fan pages there for each of the individual programs in the SEC on Pinterest. We also have a YouTube channel. Uh, if you're watching this, you, you know that. Uh, we do record this live. Uh, via Google Hangouts, and then this is posted on our YouTube page. But then you can listen to this on iTunes any, or any other place that you can listen to uh, podcasts or audio casts that have an RSS feed. But tonight, uh, you, if you're wondering where we are as far as the dates, if you're just now catching this at a later time, we're right after SEC Media Day. So we're going to talk a little bit of the Media Days in Part 1 of this podcast. Uh, as well as in part two, episode 83, the Mississippi State preview, we're going to do both of those. So uh, we'll throw a little bit of SEC uh, Media Day news into both of those. So if you're interested in that, you definitely want to take a listen to both of those because there's going to be some good stuff we talk about in the next one. But SEC Media Days were down in Alabama this week. Uh, almost 2,000 people, I think, from all told, went through that place down at uh, Hoover. So it was a mad madhouse down there for a few days. But, uh, you know, it's... What, what was your takeaway? Well, the thing that the, the biggest takeaway I got out of it, Shane, was um, just kind of the star-studded um, um, players that came. I mean, you had, um, you know, you had Jadavion Clowney from South Carolina, who's, you know, whose hit has kind of catapulted him into, um, you know, the defensive guy that could possibly win a Heisman to. Um, just the litany of quarterbacks, um, big name quarterbacks that came, um, you know, uh, to the uh, SEC Media Day. So this was not a uh, dull Media Days from the standpoint of, um, you know, players. A lot of times, you know, some of those big star players, the they kind of hold hold out and don't actually send them to the SEC Media Days. And I mean, from Aaron Murray to AJ McCarron to Johnny Manziel to Javadion Clowney to you know, um, those are just the ones off the top of my head. But, I mean, that's the thing that I was Tyler really Russell. impressed with. Yeah, I mean, Tyler Russell showed up there. And, 
Um, you know, you had um, I liked how they did Texas A&M and the Manziel deal on the same day as the four new coaches um, on the big day, and then you had um, you kind of had to split that up, and so so they had to do it a little bit different with you know 14 teams. You got four on one day, six on the other, and four on the the, the third day. So um, it was pretty cool. I mean, to come home and actually see you know Steve Spurrier giving his speech. Um, you know, at six o'clock at night when I come home and it's being broadcast live uh, on ESPN, it just shows you how big the SEC Media Day is, and um, it, it's just an impressive event. But it just shows you just the passion in the South, how everybody's really, you know, fired up for football, and what it always does here in Nashville, you know, where we actually do this, Shane, is you know. You know that once SEC Media Days is over, the Titans are fixing to go to training camp, and in two weeks you're going to have a preseason NFL football game, and in a month you're going to have college football. So it's like we're here, you know. And so I think just the excitement of it um, I think was pretty yeah. cool. I think most people are going to agree that I, they consider this the unofficial kickoff of college football oh, yeah. and, and football season in general, uh, at least here in the SEC if you're a fan here at the SEC. Uh, to me, it is. It's where you really start to understand all the excitement. Like I said, almost 2,000 folks went to Hoover to, to take part in media days, and that's just a lot of people just to listen to a lot of players and coaches say about things that are unknown yet. Yeah. And so uh, another thing, I think my biggest takeaway from media days was ESPN's presence there. And, you know, we talked about the SEC Network and – you know, the, this week they announced the date. It's going to be in August of next year. I think August 21st of 2014 is when it officially kicks off as the ESPN network. But, you know, in previous years you got Chris Lowe and some of the other couple of the beat writer guys for the SEC are there in force and, and at media days. But that's really about it. You've got a really small presence from ESPN. But from my understanding, those guys were out in full force this week. And it's just going to go to – it's just a hint, I think, for, for those fans that are, are getting anxious to have the SEC network come come around uh, next year, what's really going to be able to happen and the coverage that they're going to be able to provide. Just knowing that, that they're fully invested now in the SEC, uh, you're going to get some more of that. Uh, another big news, uh, you know, we really never even talked about this, but Feinbaum's going over to the SEC oh, network. Yeah. That's you the know, biggest thing. And in and, and, and all of our podcasts, I think that was announced back in May, uh, and towards the end of May, that, that, that he announced that he's going to join that network. But, you know, that's going to be a, that's a huge get. If you're an SEC fan, you know who, who Paul Feinbaum is. Yeah. If you're outside the SEC, you might not. But uh, he, he's definitely uh, going to be – he's going to give a lot of great interviews, some great insight. Uh, the one thing that I hope he doesn't carry with him is the callers. Um, you know, I don't know if you ever listened to the show. It's it's not on one of the local stations here, but you know, on XM, it, I used to be able to listen to it when I had XM for a while. And as good as the interviews are, it just would the, the callers annoy me. And that's no offense to callers. You know, yeah. if you're listening to this podcast, you know, call in all you want to the radio shows, but. That's the reason we don't take those. Is it yeah. they just it drives me nuts. Yeah. To to have to listen to these guys and and yes, we're homers. You know, we we're going to we're going to have a fan a fan's perspective on this with the round table. But we try to do that from an educated standpoint. We we try to be at least listening to the voice of reason when someone has something else to say. And and you don't get that in the call-in shows and yeah. and and part of it is, and, and you know, you get some of the local radio show hosts here do the same thing. They're there to entice that and incite that just ignorance that some of these fans have, and, and play off of that and make that an entertainment. And to me, that's not entertainment. Yeah. It drives me nuts. Well, the thing I, I think the thing that you can take away from the fine bomb deal is that the SEC is going to do their network unlike the Big Ten and some of the other conferences, they're going to make sure that they have content that is on cutting edge, that is, they're going to be able to not shy away from, you know, 
because there's a balancing act that you don't want to be just a, hey, this we're going to show games and it's going to be just an SEC commercial. Um, they want really driven content so that if there's something that actually happens off the field in the SEC, they're going to have to report it just like any other news network. Just don't let um, Skip Bayless and, come over to the... You know. right, exactly. I mean, but I think, fine like bomb, I, I think Fine Bomb actually adds an entertainment value to um, to this that is going to be unlike any other conference alignment. So I'm interested to see kind of how all that, that works out. But I think that's a huge thing for the SEC to say, we want content. We want to make sure that we're bringing everything to the table. Um, and it's just not, um, you know, it's just not a conference where we're going to show, you know, 50 softball games and, um, you know, whenever it comes around that it's going to have some, you know, some content that's going to be individualized between the institutions and it's going to be conference driven. And um, so I'm excited about it. Now, you know, again, we're, we're late to the show about talking about this, but I still think it's it's newsworthy for, for folks that are interested in the SEC network and SEC. But now, have they given any idea of what his program is going to be? I don't know. I think um, I, I mean, think that's kind of a ad, I think that's an ad lib. I know I know that they've actually talked about they're going to have an an SEC. You know, they're going to have three SEC games that are going to be televised on the SEC network every Saturday. So we already know that. But there's going to be other things, such as they're going to have their own kind of college game day live that's going to be an SEC, you know, driven deal. So, you know, a University of Kentucky or a Mississippi State that we're fans of could probably, if they have, you know, one of those third games, you know, that doesn't get the CBS or the huge ESPN, they can go on the SEC network and it might be the time that the SEC college game day crew comes to, um, you know, comes to town. They're going to do some shows like that um, that I think is going to be somewhat unique, um, you know, just because of the way the, um, the the college atmosphere works in the SEC. So it, it, it may or may not just be a, a video simulcast of his radio show. We just don't Yeah, know. yeah. I mean, he's going to be involved pretty heavily, though. Okay. Well, I'm hoping it's more than just the, the radio show for, for, for my yes. sake. I could, it's completely um, stingy on my part to say that, but I think I'm not alone when it comes to some of that about, about callers and call in and the way that it gets done. So. Well, let's get right into anything else on the media days. I know we're, we've got a couple things we're going to talk about on the next podcast, uh, so we'll save the things we've already talked about covering. But anything else? I know you mentioned Clowney. Uh, you know, he was the he was the talk of the show, and then he, he rolled that right into an ESPY, did he not, I think? Yes, he did. You know, the thing about Clowney that I thought was so interesting was, and, you know, obviously having a brother-in-law that's a South Carolina fan, I hear a lot of stuff anyway, and their hatred of Clemson is, you know, is fantastic. Um, but, you know, I remember two years ago him telling me that, you know, the reports of, um, you know, Tosh Boyd uh, basically telling them to, you know, quit quit coming after him. You know, they had blown the game open and they were just coming with, you know, relentless force and he was just getting sacked every other play. And then, of course, this past year, Clowney has four and a half sacks and, um, you know, he basically goes on national TV and, and says that, um, the basically Taj Boyd is scared of him and scared of their defensive line. And so it was pretty interesting that, you know, um, it's kind of interesting how the SEC media days creates that environment where if a, if a player lets down the guard as big as Javadion Clowney is, and he actually tells the truth, um, it's pretty interesting. But uh, one of the other comments I like, Shane, is, I got to watch, I got to listen to Spurrier because anytime you can get Spurrier and just kind of listen to him, he's a pretty funny guy. But um, you know, in classic SEC media days, uh, uh, um, some young reporter asked him that uh, how his 50th high school reunion went. He had just come back to Tennessee to go to his 50th um, class reunion, and uh, he said it was a little sleepy. <laughs> which I thought was a which I thought was a classic answer by Spurrier that at nine thirty everybody was pretty much gone. So he said it was a little sleepy, but uh, it went well, and there's lots of them there. So uh, he was a uh, he was pretty entertaining. But um, it's just cool to kind of see that environment, man. I just I enjoy it because if you follow your team, it's a 
you know, all the schools have their interactive follow, you know, following them throughout the day and their internal videos and that type of stuff. So it's kind of pretty cool to kind of see that because you're so ready for football um, that, you know, it's just a way just to kind of entice that hunger. Yeah, no, it was it was a great event and a lot of great interviews. Even the local radio stations, you know, they go in full force. Both both of them were there doing live live interviews and stuff. And a lot of just a lot of great content. And and you're right, you catch these players and these coaches in an environment that's different than when the season starts. Yeah. So you're able to get just a little bit of a different side of these of these individuals that you might not get once once the season starts and practice has, has resumed and it's it's full force um, and you're back into game mode. But uh, it was it was nice, it was refreshing, it was a, a good time. And so we're excited that uh, you know the unofficial kickoff of football has started. But let's let's switch gears a little bit and go to the second part of this podcast tonight, and that's going to be our actual preview. And, and tonight we're going to look at the University of Florida, the Gators, uh, coming off of a, in my opinion, a successful season. I know, oh. <laughs> I know, Muschamp says uh, he said that the only way it's considered a success is if they're, you know, basically pulling a Calipari and hanging banners. But, you know, when we did this show last season about this time and we were looking at Florida, I, I was giving them six, seven wins. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't sold on, on what they were able to do. But, you know, they brought in a piece from, was that uh, Bo- from Boise, Boise State? Yeah. Brent Peace from, from Boise State. And that was the missing piece because the year before that they had um, a oh, cat from Notre Dame. Uh, his name's Charlie. Charlie, Charlie Weiss. Charlie Weiss from Notre Dame is the uh, offensive coordinator, and it was just stale. Uh, they couldn't get anything moving, couldn't do any. I mean, what, they were six and seven, is that right? Yeah, seven. Uh, now they had won, they won seven games, but barely. Okay, yeah. so seven and six. They went to yeah. Um, but, you know, coming off of that, just a total disappointment. No, I'm talking about Charlie Weiss's year. They, they didn't even uh, play the whole game. I can't even remember. I don't know. Um, by all measurements, it was not a successful season for Florida that year. Um, but, you know, Brent Peace brought in a whole new excitement. I still think they have a few pieces missing on that offensive oh, yeah. uh, side of the ball. Uh, but you look at the defense, and from day one, uh, Muschamp knows how to coach defense. And, you know, he's got the, the re- uh, reins on the defense. He's got those guys a top ten defense. I don't think that you're going to see an issue with that again this year. You're probably looking at another top 10 defense. So defensively, they're going to be strong. They're going to be sound. You're going to have an offensive side that's got a quarterback that there's no controversy. The ball's been handed to him. It's Driscoll's, Driscoll's team. And I think that's going to, I think it's going to play a lot of the leadership factor that, that might not be, uh, you know, something he didn't have last year. Cause if you look at, look at it, you know, this time last year going into, to camp, they didn't know who the starting quarterback was going to be. Right. So, you know, it's hard to be the leader on the field when you might not be the starter. And so just to have that peace of mind to know that they're the, they're counting on you, you're their go-to guy, it all rests with you. Now all of a sudden you can take the football, you can be the team leader, and you can do some of the leadership things that you're looking for in your quarterback. Yeah. I think one of the things, I mean, if I take a look at the offensive side of the ball, you know, they didn't really, you know, they they really got back to last year just pounding the ball, and they really rode Mike Gillespie, Gillespie or Gillespie, I can't ever say his name. Um, Gillespie. Gillespie is what I meant, Mike Gillespie. Gillespie. Um, you know, they really rode him. They became a running football team. And, you know, the thing with, the thing with Driscoll is – or the thing that I actually see, if you look at all of the returning quarterbacks, you know what you have in Manziel somewhat. You know what you have in McCarron. You know what you have in Aaron Murray. You know what you have in Tyler Russell. You know what you have in do, do we, do, James we, Franklin. We'll talk about them next, but do we really know what we have in Tyler Russell? Well, I mean, that's the whole – that's kind of the whole thing. We We know what you have in these guys where this guy, I think, has – he has a high. I think he has the ability to jump higher in a ceiling category from this year than where he where he's been. Um, whether he actually makes a leap or not is a different story. The other thing I think that plays a big factor in to Florida is is now 
Brissett is gone. Um, yeah. And so now with exactly. Driscoll, you know, he has a tendency. He's a big kid. He's six six, a big kid that can run. And you remember last year he got dinged up just a couple, you know, a couple of nicks here and there where he had to miss a little bit of time. They got nobody behind that, and and now they're they've got to find a new running back, which they you know they got a big kid that's back there that they think is going to take over. Yeah, they, and they, I think they really like that Matt Jones guy. The, yeah, from spring practice they were they were high on him. Uh, you know, but he's I mean, big. He's big. He's he's what they need back there to help relieve some of that off of off of. Uh, and I think I think the kicker too is that you know you got wide receivers that that are just untested and. So, you know, is Florida, I think Florida, you know, can they be better than they what they were last year from an offensive standpoint? I think they have a higher ceiling um, just because I think Driscoll can take it to another level, um, but you're going to have to have some production from some other people. But defensively, I mean, you lose, I mean, you lose a, a Matt Elam, a John Bostic, and a Sharif Floyd. I mean, those are three levels of the defense that you lose pretty impactful players where the biggest thing that Florida did was they they really turned the ball over last year. You know, they went from like, you know, minus 12 in 2011 to like plus 15 in turnover margin or, or you know. And so it was it was a complete reverse uh, fortunes, you know. They've got – They've got a, I think a very, I think they've got even a deeper defensive line that can help with the impact of the losses in the secondary. Um, but um, you know they got, they've got some holes to fill. But they probably got, I mean they obviously got talented players. But I think the defense has got to play as well as they did last year. And so that's where, you know, can they repeat what they did last year? I mean they went 11 and one in the regular season last year. And outside of a fumble going into the end zone against Georgia, they had the best resume in college football. I mean, outside of Notre Dame, that was undefeated. I mean, they they really were sitting there not in the SEC game because of one critical play um, and sitting at 11-1, and one, and then they, they went into the Sugar Bowl like, hey, we're just going to take care of Louisville, um, and then just got run slap over. Um, and – Obviously, we're down from the fact that they didn't make it to the SEC championship game. They didn't play um, and have an opportunity in a in a championship sitting at at eleven and one. And so, it's just one of those deals where um, it's kind of hard to judge what Florida's going to be. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that has to happen for them. Yeah, and. And something that Florida had last year that really helped them, I think, was that second game of the season against A and M, because, I mean, if you remember watching that game, that really should have been A and M's game. So they lost. I mean, they won a really close game there with Texas A and M. Uh, that whole first half, Texas really took control of that. When Florida turned it around the second half, their defense came out, really uh, shut down Manziel at that point. And to, and to look back as the season keeps progressing and progressing on, you know, and A&M does, keeps doing what they're doing, it's like, man, we beat a really good team. Yeah. And so yeah. they were able to really build off of that from week two against an A&M program that they didn't know what to expect to. Right, and I think I think the other thing to take into consideration in this is that it kind of tells you how, how volatile they were last year is they beat A&M and Florida State on the road. They beat LSU, South Carolina at home. But if you remember, man, they had to have a blocked field goal against UL Lafayette just to close the door in the fourth quarter. Yeah, that's you right. Know, they had to block that punt, and then then they had Missouri. They had to have they had to have James Franklin throw four picks just so that they could get out of the game with that. So they had these games where they just decided to, for whatever it was. Um, you know, they just didn't play well, and then they, you know, they stepped up in the big games and won all the ones. And then the Georgia game was the one that, you know, it, it be, kind of became a big back and forth, um, you know, and you have a, you know, you just have a fumble go through the end zone. It's just one of the things that just devastates you from that standpoint. Um, but, but you kind of hit on a point that, that has to be corrected this year, and I think we've talked about how it is, and that's going to be the offense. 
You know, that Missouri game, it was there was 21 combined points between both teams. Yeah. You just don't see that very often in, in the S, in SEC play to have such a low-scoring game. And same thing for the Georgia game. I mean, 79, that's 20, 26 combined points. Uh, so, so, you know, both of those games, they, uh, you know, it's just um, abysmal scoring on both parts. And so that's something they've addressed this year. Um, you know, like you said, Matt Jones, I think, is going to be a big help back there so that uh, – so now I can't even say his name. You've got me tongue tied. Driscoll. No, the the running back from last year. Just a Gillisley. Gillisley. There we go. Yeah. Gosh, I was gonna say Gillespie, and it's like, well, oh, <laughs> Billy G's way out of the SEC. Uh, those those headaches are still haunting me. Um, but uh, you know, he he had what he had a thousand yards plus last year. Oh so, yeah. So you know, you you're gonna have that hole to fill, and I think they've got the capable body back there. One of the big questions, though, is going to be your wide receivers. Right. I mean, that's the thing. I think that's the big eye opener, and, and and it's Florida, which is really surprising. You know that they've struggled for really about four or five years to have. You know, Gillisley came on last year, but you know it had been a pretty good stretch there where, you know, they had a hard time running the football. Yeah, they did. Yeah, you know, right. I mean, and, and even in Tebow's world, when Urban Meyer was there, you know, Tebow really was. He accounted for most of the yards. Yeah. Yeah, um, and definitely and, most of those touchdowns from, from the yeah. running game. I yeah. think the other thing is that, you know, I've, I've kind of done a little bit of research on is their offensive line. They've got two stud um, transfers coming in, um, and they've got a lot of guys coming back. So um, it looks like if they can improve from a pass protection standpoint, uh, which they, you know, incurred a bunch of – I think that's a little bit of the offensive line and a little bit of Driscoll um, – you know, that they had a lot of the sack issues that they had last year. Driscoll tends to hold on to the ball a lot when he probably should have gotten rid of it being a young quarterback. But um, I'm interested to see how Driscoll can be because I think of of all of the quarterbacks in this league, I think he has the ability to take a bigger step um, than, than most of the other ones. Not that – because I think a lot of the other ones have kind of proven – that they can play at this level and, I, and from a passing standpoint. I think I know what you're trying to say. So you mean like upside potential? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, That's exactly what I'm trying to say. For, for the, the greatest improvement year over year, he has yeah. the great – I mean, but he, I think you're right there. Um, I, you know, I'd have to look. There might be – I don't know, James Franklin I would put in that category yeah. because of his injuries last year. He was he was a major disappointment over in Missouri. Um and, and James Franklin, you know, really is, he's kind of, hey, if you don't, if he doesn't start out well, and I'm pretty sure y'all talked about this last week, if he didn't start out well, he's he's not going to play. Um, they got they got guys behind him and um, recruits in there that, uh, you know, they kind of have lived up to it. And, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see, you know, from that standpoint. But I think from Florida's standpoint is they got to throw the ball more than 140 yards a game. Um, and you know, it was the, I think the second worst, um, uh, yardage per game, uh, from a passing standpoint since like 1979. So, um, I mean, just think about that. I mean, that just shows you how dominant they were from a defensive standpoint, how they created points last year to, to go 11 and one in the SEC, um, in regular season, which I thought was, uh, I think way above their ceiling, um, you know, from that standpoint. But, uh, I mean, what do you think they're going to do this year? What is your predictions? Well, we, we can get into that. That's where I was headed next uh, is we'll take a look at their schedule this year and just kind of look at the, the tough games they're going to have here real quick. I'm pulling mine up as we speak. Uh, you know, they're going to start off with with a pretty good cupcake. If you look at this for the first week, um, and you'll notice that as we go through here, there's a lot of programs that have a, a good game the, t- the first week. Yeah. Some of them aren't, um, you know, cupcake give me's. Um, they're they're not also, you know, the toughest teams that you're ever going to face. But they're respectable programs in week one. I, I won't say that Florida's in that echelon. Yeah. They start off with Toledo, um, you know, but then they kick off with a couple of tough ones after that. So we're gonna I'm gonna give them the win against Toledo. There's no issues with me there giving them that one. Um, Miami, uh, the U, they they go down to Miami. I think it's nice if you're a, 
a fan of that. That, that used to be a, a big game. They always used to play quite often uh, to see that come back on the schedule. But Miami's that program is just a decimated program. It's still down. Uh, there's a lot to go to before it's going to be where it needs to be. So I'm going to give them a two and zero start right there. What about you? Yeah, that's uh, yeah. I mean, that's a tough that's a tough place to go. I I think um, yeah, Toledo and Miami. I'm going to take both of those as wins. Um, you know, I really have a hard time giving Florida um, any difficulty until they get in the mid October when they go to LSU. Um, you know, just kind of looking at this thing. Um, I don't know about you, but I mean, yeah, I think Tennessee. I mean, Tennessee in the swamp. Do you do you see that as a victory? No. I, I think yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Um, and then at Kentucky. I mean, you're gonna Commonwealth's a tough place to play. <laughs> they 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 tend to actually play them pretty well, but yeah, uh, I, I think I think they're gonna take care of the business there. But uh, I, mean, I mean, Arkansas you... at home. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right. I mean, as much as I, I would like to say Kentucky can win, they Kentucky can win that game, um, but I don't think they will. So you're looking at three, four, five and zero oh, because you're right. They they have Arkansas at home October fifth. Uh, then they have LSU. Um, you know, we've not discussed LSU yet. I just don't know what we have with them. I think LSU is going to be an eight-win team this year. So I think they're going to be down. I think they're going to have a significant drop. But what I what I'm saying, what I'm thinking, and and I'm just kind of doing an overall kind of view here. I think I think um, I think Florida is not as good as South Carolina and Georgia. Um, I think they finished third uh, at best in the East because I think South Carolina, I think they got some juice going. And I think George is just going to be an offensive juggernaut, dude. And defensively, I think they're going to be really good. Um, and I just – my prediction is I think they're going to lose three games in the SEC. I think they'll win nine games. I think they'll go nine and three. Just where are they going to lose the three games? You just don't know. I mean, I think they're going to lose at South Carolina. I think they're going to lose the Georgia game. Um, and so you're going to say they're going to lose at – um, at Vanderbilt, I'm sorry. Either Vanderbilt a Vanderbilt at home or, or at LSU. I think in LSU at LSU. I mean LSU in October 12th, they could be pretty desperate. Um, and so I just think I, I just think with Georgia's ability, and Georgia could lose that Miami game. I mean they could lose. I mean I mean Florida, they could lose that that early game, but. I see them kind of catching a little momentum, and I think getting to LSU is going to be the first real test, and um, it might be a chance that LSU actually plays well. But um, I just got a feeling they're going to lose. Um, yeah, they're going to lose two or three of those games. I just predict they'll probably be a more of a nine-win season this year than eleven, you know, eleven and one that they were last year. I'm going to I'm going to agree with the nine and three record. I like that. Um, I. I, I don't know if they're going to lose all three in the SEC, though. Yeah. Um, you know, I see them losing two of these three, Georgia, Vanderbilt, South Carolina. Which which two, I just couldn't tell you at this point. But I, I could see them losing two of those three. And that's a tough stretch to go two and three uh, against those programs because Vanderbilt's got a lot to prove this year. They're a much, they're, for what they were last year, they're a much improved program. Um, yeah. So you're going to get two losses out of those three. Um, the other loss is going to come either um, with Florida State or um, LSU. Yeah. And that's where you're. That's where I think it's going to happen. You're going to get a hiccup at one of those two games, uh, and you're going to get a hiccup at two of the other three SEC games. I so, mean, it, it would never surprise me, Shane, for them to go into Baton Rouge, win the ball game, go into Missouri. Missouri throws the ball around. Next thing you know, Florida's defense – Kind of does a little bit of like Louisville can't get the offensive start. You know, Missouri is going to be terrible on defense, but if they can get the ball thrown around from an offensive standpoint and find a team that just can't get it going offensively, all of a sudden you got upset city at you know Missouri. So um, you know, there's it's the thing about the SEC, and you know, I think State Saban said it perfect the other day that it's just so hard to predict the the schedule. Um, ahead of time, you know, he, he cracked on the uh, 
reporters that they've picked uh, 21 in the last 21 years. They've gotten four of them right. So if he was four and 17, he'd be pumping gas at his daddy's gas station. So um, it just goes to show you that it's just you never know where it's going to be. But I think a nine-win ball game, I think it's going to be right about where they're going to be and where those three losses come from could be a number of ways. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally agree with you there. Anything else we want to say for Florida before we wrap up tonight's episode and, and go on into the next episode? I just, I'm intrigued to see offensively what they can do. Um, you know, I think they got, uh, and specifically the receiver side of it, you know, they actually took your boy Joker Phillips. So, um, you know, from a coaching standpoint, so, um, you kind of see what he maybe can bring to the table because I know he was very successful at that at one time. So, well, and and you could see him, uh, you know, bringing Trey Burton and making him that jack of all trades that he used so well up at Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, you know, even though he's the wide receivers coach now, uh, you know, I think that that Muschamp puts a lot of of faith into. Joker and what Joker thinks just because he's done it all. You know, he's yeah. been a coordinator. He's been a head coach. He's been in the SEC for years and years. So there's a wealth of knowledge that, that he brings to the table. Um, and, and you could see Trey Burton have a lot of wrinkles thrown in there where he's lining up, um, you know, direct snaps, being the quarterback, uh, being a receiver, doing it all. And, and, you know, Kentucky Kentucky had a lot of success with that formula. Yeah. So – yeah, you know that's but that's one person. Don't know what's uh, what's happened there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. My video disappeared there for a moment, so I didn't know what happened there. Um, so you, and that's going to be an interesting. You're you're right. When it boils down to it, though, the the biggest question mark in all of Florida is the receiving core. Yeah. And what 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 are they going to have this year in that and. Will Driscoll have somebody to throw it to? What you're also going to be able to determine because of that is, is it Driscoll's problem or the receiving course problem? And you should be able to figure that out. You didn't know what it was last year. And so you're going to be able to, to map all that out when it's all said and done. Um, I agree with you with 9-3 and three for Florida. Uh, we're going to wrap this one up. And you want to check it out. The next podcast is going to be on Mississippi State. So, guys, with that, we're going to call this podcast done. Awesome.